And uh, welcome everyone to uh, the 2018 annual meeting of Florida Keys Electric Co-ops. Great to see so many of you out here today. And uh, especially great to see John Kimsey, our banker, sitting right here in the front row as well. You saw the numbers we incurred in Irma. Uh, a lot of that is currently being financed by CFC. And they have graciously uh, extended some additional lines of credit to us to get us through this hurricane season if we are unfortunate enough to get hit by another storm. So great to see you, John. I hope you brought that suitcase full of cash down with you because we, we may need it. I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, food that we, we gave you this year or presented this year. Yeah, good. We thought we'd uh, shake it up a little bit. We've had the sliced beef for the last three or four years and uh, Eddie Dudley had perfected that fish uh, recipe and, and technique and we've had a couple trial runs here and there with it. We, I really like it and I'm glad to hear that you guys did too. So thumbs up. Maybe we'll go ahead and do that again next year then. All right. Also, hope you had time uh, to look at all the informational booths we had set up out there. Our, our employees spend uh, quite a bit of time putting those together, and they always do enjoy talking to you guys about the, the various work their departments do. And uh, they usually have some pretty good uh, giveaway prizes out there as well. So I hope, uh, hope those were, were good for you this year, too. Typically, one of the most difficult things about this presentation, besides having to give it, is trying to figure out what kind of theme uh, we want to talk about. We don't want to uh, present you guys the same presentation year after year with the same information. Nikki and I spend quite a bit of time early in the year trying to, trying to settle on a theme. We did not have any problem at all figuring out what we were going to talk about this year. That's Hurricane Irma. Uh, we started looking at that hurricane on about August 29th when it was Invest 93L. Uh, we did not have a good feeling about this one for some reason. Just the way it started and the location that it was, uh, we really started keeping a close eye on it and began to, to seriously plan for an impact from that storm. So that's basically what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Uh, what we did before Irma, during and after Irma to uh, recover from that storm. It's kind of, kind of going to be a linear timeline and we're going to go all the way back to 2006 because we really started preparing for Hurricane Irma then. Uh, we'd just gone through the 2004-2005 hurricane seasons. We had been hit by seven different storms, mostly tropical storms. Wilma, I think, was probably a category one. But we recognized the need at that time to strengthen uh, our system. We adopted at that point in time uh, construction standards uh, to meet extreme wind loading criteria for any new construction we did on our system and any reconstruction we did as well. Uh, the board authorized that construction standard, they encouraged that construction standard, and we began following it then. And you can see uh, the incremental cost of that from 2006 through 2017 was about $45 million over and above what we normally would have spent on uh, maintaining and, and building the electric system. System. A very large financial commitment on the part of the board. You can see up here on the screen some of the different things we've been doing since 2006 to harden the system. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, key there, the transmission structure strengthening. Uh, we stepped up our inspections of all those large transmission structures above the water line and below. We have seven or eight miles of transmission that crosses water. It's been in salt water for 45 years, so you know we need to pay a lot of attention to it. Also, uh, we started using larger wooden poles whenever we use those in construction and more concrete and in particular duct line iron poles. That's basically water pipe, same stuff the Aqueduct Authority uses. Uh, it's very strong, but it's a lot lighter than concrete and easier to work with, and it performed well uh, during Irma. Uh, we continue with our annual aerial, thermal, and visual inspections of the system. Uh, we will be doing our helicopter inspection uh, in a couple of weeks, I think, uh, starting that again. Any issues we find there, we fix those immediately uh, prior to hurricane season. And we talk about this a lot, uh, vegetation management. We all know the power lines and trees don't mix. Most of the problems we had in Irma were tree-related problems, not so much wind. Um, you know, trees blowing over into power lines and knocking them down. And probably the most obvious thing we did uh, in that time frame was construct the Tavernier Operations Center, which is a Category 5 rated storm-hardened uh, building. And I'll be talking more about some of the features and, and how we utilize that building in just a few minutes. This is going to be like a little time lapse. These are the daily uh, storm forecasts that we received starting when it was Invest 92L and working through uh, to September 10th. And I wanted to show you this because if you look at each one every day, that forecast changed. 
we were presented with a lot of kind of confusing forecast information that looked like it might miss us to the east, it might go south, it might you know, not hit us at all or not be very strong. But in all through that process, we were having to try and make decisions with data that was constantly changing on us. And not only that, uh, you can see there we had, had another tropical storm pop up while we were about to get hit by Hurricane Irma, which just added to our anxiety as well. This I really wanted to put up because it really does show when things got very serious. Sunday, September 3rd, that's the forecast we had in the morning. It looks like it's going to do that usual recurve east of the Bahamas, miss the United States, maybe all together, but certainly no impact to us. I personally, that was on a Sunday, I was kind of starting and breathe easy whenever I saw that. Got up Monday morning, first thing I did was look at the forecast and that is how different that forecast was between the third and fourth. We went from probably being missed to most probably uh, having a severe impact from at that point in time what they were projecting to be a category four storm. So at this point I'm going to kind of walk you through each day uh, some of the critical decisions we made and, and things that we did uh, to get ready for Irma's impact on the 10th. But basically when we saw that forecast on the 4th, uh, we pretty well had an idea at that point in time that we would not be able to rely on our traditional cooperative mutual aid agreements to, to help recover from the storm. Our usual method is to prepare all our facilities for a storm if we think we're going to get hit kind of hunker down, ride it out, and the storm passes, go out, take a look at the system, do a damage assessment, and figure out what assets we're going to need, how many contract crews or whatever we might need, and order them at that point in time to bring them in. We knew that wasn't going to work here because we had a good feeling the storm was probably going to run up the state, and we would not be able to get people after it hit because a lot of Florida utilities were going to be impacted as well. So at that point, we decided we couldn't wait uh, to reserve crews until after the storm passed. September 5th, again, uh, you know, we had a tropical storm pop up behind Irma out there, and again, we uh, are at this point kind of in the middle of the cone right there projected to hit Middle Keys as uh, a Category 4, very strong Category 4 storm. So at that point, we were making preliminary contacts with various contractors uh, throughout the United States, not just Florida. And what we found there was that contract crews were going fast. A lot of the big IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, Florida Power and Light and the like, were out doing the same thing we were on a much greater scale, trying to uh, lock down crews to help them recover if they were impacted. Wednesday, uh, we started thinking that it may shift a little west here. You can see, the, you know, yesterday's forecast was kind of middle keys. Now Key West was getting real concerned at this point. Again, a Category 4 storm uh, moving just a little bit west, but we did feel like we were still going to have some significant impact out of that. So at that point in time, we authorized Storm Services, which is one of the contractors we use for uh, basically the base camps, uh, to mobilize enough uh, resources, base camps, two separate, to feed uh, up to 400 people a day, multiple uh, meals a day, and house up to 300 people. Whenever we put that order in, that became, it says a $300,000 non-refundable commitment, really it was about $360,000 non-refundable commitment, meaning if the storm fizzled, if it misses completely, we were going to be on the hook to pay that to reserve uh, those, those facilities. The county uh, at that time issued their mandatory residential evacuation starting at 5 o'clock that afternoon, which meant we could no longer have our employees or require them to stay. When a re uh, residential evacuation order is issued, we release our employees to evacuate should they want to. If they want to volunteer to stay behind, we, we like that and, and we'll allow them to do so. So that meant at 5 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, this was five, what, five days before Irma's impact, uh, our offices were shut down and they did not reopen until several days after Irma passed through. You guys paid attention to that residential evacuation. I took this photo about 7 a.m. on Friday morning. This is outside the Tavernier Operations Center. I was heading in for the day. This is looking north on the southbound lane of US-1. I'm standing in the middle of the highway in the morning rush hour and there's not a car in sight. What you can't really tell from this picture is on the northbound lane, it looked exactly the same. Not a car in sight. So that was a very eerie feeling and I'm, I'm kind of glad I took that photo because I probably will never see that again or I hope I never see that again. 
Uh, Thursday, September 7th. Now it's really getting serious. Uh, kind of highlighted the, uh, the wind forecast for Sunday, September 10th, and you can see we're now at a strong Category 5 hurricane. And if you look at the, uh, that, that forecast of 72 hours, I looked those coordinates up, and that was about 30 miles ocean side of the Tavernier Operations Center at 165 miles an hour Sunday morning is what we were faced with at this point in time. A direct hit to Tavernier. So at that point, we had made basically our final decisions on uh, what kind of crews, the number of crews we were going to bring in. And that was one of the big discussions that John Stewart and I had, our chief operating officer and a couple of the operations guys, was just how many people did we think we could manage in a situation like this. It doesn't do any good to bring 5,000 people in to help you out if you can't get materials to them, supplies to them, fuel to them, and, and a way for them to work. So we figured somewhere around 350 to 400 people in addition to our own, we could manage that, we could get materials to them and, and work them effectively. So that, that was kind of what we had in mind at that point in time. Also of significance on the 7th, the last hospital in our service territory closed. Whenever that happens, we will no longer allow our crews to work any kind of dangerous work. If we can't provide critical care to them, we don't have them out working on energized lines or with dangerous equipment at all. So that meant at 7 p.m. we basically shut down completely. Uh, we could not respond to even routine outages. And again, think this is two or three days before we started feeling the impact of Irma. And the co-op is basically shut down for all intents and purposes. Friday, it didn't get much better. Uh, as you see, it's still uh, a 160 mile an hour wind forecast that we were looking at. The storm track did shift a little bit further southwest of us, more towards the Marathon area, where it ultimately impacted just uh, to the south of that. At that point, we had already ordered up 40 distribution line crews. Uh, we had five transmission crews that we were trying to order up. It took a couple of extra days to get those guys down, or, or ordered anyway. Uh, additional 20 tree trimming crews, and uh, we, we were going to grab 12 damage assessment teams to help us assess the system after Irma hit. We authorized all those assets to begin moving to Florida ahead of the storm, and we say here that that was a daily six-figure commitment. Uh, it was a high six-figure commitment. Uh, whenever you have that many men, trucks, and equipment coming in, the minute they get in their trucks to head down here, we are employing them and we are paying them to come help us out. So uh, we went from $300,000, $360,000 commitment to close to a million dollars a day from this point moving forward. That's how you get to $20 million in, uh, in restoration cost. Significantly and surprisingly to me, 83 out of 115 employees evacuated. They were paying attention to these forecasts as well. Um, I'm glad they did. They, they should do that, but we had never, in the storms that we were faced with before, had that sort of uh, evacuation from our employees themselves. And we moved the last of our vehicles in the Tavernier and Marathon warehouses to protect them from flooding and uh, wind from the storm. So I'm going to take uh, just a minute here and back up to 2009. Uh, that's when we completed the Tavernier Operations Center. And while we were building that, uh, we made three different construction videos. They're still on our website, by the way, if you'd like to take a look at them. But we did one when we were first starting construction on that. We did another one when the building was about half finished. And then we did the last one after we uh, had moved into the, bu the building. So what I'm going to do is show you a video here, an excerpt from that last construction video where I'm talking about what we designed into uh, the Tavernier Warehouse, what we expected it to do for us, and then I'm going to show you what it did do for us during Irma. You can see it's a large warehouse, but the space is necessary for all the materials that we have to keep uh, stored here to, to keep the power going to you guys uh, each and every day as well as during storm events. Uh, one of the main features of the building, if you look all the way down to the very end, is uh, the large roll-up door. We did uh, design this so that uh, we could get our bucket trucks into this facility during the storm. Uh, this is a Category 5 rated section of the building. Uh, the administrative operations section we were just in, we tried to design that up to 200 mile an hour wind loading. And here that uh, wasn't really possible because of all the uh, roll-up doors, uh, although we did put the strongest uh, Cat 5 rated roll-up doors in this building. Uh, I mentioned in prior videos, the, uh, the elevation of the floor of the warehouse is 12 feet above sea level. And uh, our intention is, prior to a, uh, a storm strike of our service territory, we will 
basically clear these aisles out of material and bring our bucket trucks in here, shut all the doors down, basically button everything up in here to keep it out of uh, the wind as well as flood waters. So that as soon as the storm subsides, we'd be able to uh, essentially open and roll up doors, start rolling our trucks out, hit the road and start uh, restoring service. I took that video uh, before we had all the trucks loaded in. This is after they were all in and buttoned up, and you can see this is looking back from the direction I was walking, completely and totally full. And if you guys notice that large truck outside flying that large flag, it's in there at the end of that aisle. That's our high voltage transmission truck. So we got our biggest truck in there as well. Two things I noticed about that uh, that video, number one, the building did just as we planned, and number two, my hair was a heck of a lot darker in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a little bit more than Doc does here, so, so, so far, so good. Uh, for a minute, while uh, we're talking about the Tavernier Operations Center, just kind of take you back. Uh, when we were thinking about building this building, we, we, we wanted something that was going to be very strong, a storm-hardened operations center. We wanted it to be very environmentally friendly and energy efficient. We wanted it to be able to operate in standalone mode, cut off from everything for 72 hours. And we wanted it to be an attractive building. We didn't want a big ugly slab for you guys to have to look at all the time. I think personally that, that this building hits every single thing we asked for and a lot of the credit of that goes to Mr. David Zelk who is the architect of this building. <laughs> He's a member of Florida Keys Electric Co-op. He's retired from uh, the architecture business right now, but Dave, if you'd stand up, I'd like to, so everyone can see you, recognize you. Where is he? Ah, back over here. Big round of applause to David Zelt. Thank you, Dave. The one thing we forgot to design in this was comfortable beds. We have army cots and you cannot sleep on those things at all. So next time we'll, we'll add that in, I think. All right, we've talked so far about everything we did getting ready for Hurricane Irma. So now I'm gonna tell you what we did once it impacted us and then how we uh, restored power back to you guys in the, in the manner that we did. This is Irma on Sunday. I took this uh, from the office, my office window. Uh, and you can see that we had 32 employees uh, that rode out Irma in the operations center and our facility down in Marathon. I think we had about 26 people here, employees and a few dependents. And in Marathon, there were a few employees that stayed in that building as well. But uh, as Irma blew through, uh, really it started, I think, somewhere around noon, Saturday, uh, we started getting the real good squalls coming through. That's an interesting picture right there. Uh, but it really started ramping up about noon and continued to gain strength all through the night, probably peaking in the early morning hours of Sunday. And it, uh, it lasted well into uh, the late afternoon on Sunday as well. So it, it felt like a long time uh, whenever it was blowing through. But despite how strong the storm was and how long it seemed to last, uh, we never did lose transmission service from uh, basically the Florida City substation where we pick up power from Florida Power and Light all the way down to our Tavernier substation where both transmission lines terminate and then go as a single line south from there. We had about 90% of our members out, but that meant 10% never lost power uh, throughout the entire event of Irma. If you were in the Key Largo, Tavernier area, likely you had power. Uh, all three of those substations we have, the Jewfish, Key Largo, and Tavernier substations remain energized throughout the storm. And 
for each of those substations. Some of the feeders stayed hot the entire time too. So uh, that was, was very significant. At this point though, everybody from uh, what Snake Creek south all the way through Key West was out of power by uh, Sunday afternoon. Around 3 p.m., maybe a little bit later, uh, it says a preliminary survey team. It really wasn't. We were all so tired of being in the building and listening to the wind. We scattered as soon as, uh, as soon as it calmed down enough for us to start getting some trucks out and vehicles out to take a look at, uh, at what the conditions were. And then uh, Monday, we'd already ha uh, had a helicopter scheduled to come in. I took this video from the helicopter on Monday. And I think at this point when I was in the helicopter, we just kind of made contact down to Marathon with some of our uh, land assets too. This is, uh, I think, the Marathon boat yard. Uh, but anyway, we'd had a helicopter scheduled to come down. He did come down. Uh, they threw me on it, I think, to get me out of their hair, the operations guys, and just said, go go fly. Uh, so I did. Uh, I wish I had taken more video, but the problem is the flight helmet I had was too big. It kept falling down over my eyes. I kept trying to push it up, hold the phone up, and I was deathly afraid there's no doors on the helicopter. Then my phone and everything would go flying out. But it wouldn't really matter at that point because we didn't have any cell phone, internet, or anything anyway. So it really wasn't doing me much good. Uh, but what I noticed or saw uh, was the damage to the system seemed to be a whole lot less than what we thought it would be. As we flew down towards Marathon, I just knew I'd start seeing utter destruction along the way. And uh, there was some, as you can see with that picture there in, in, in some of the neighborhoods. But what I could see from the air was, you know, looking down streets was a lot of poles up. I thought that we would just see street after street after street of distribution poles down, wire on the ground, and a ton of work to have to do. Pleasantly surprised that uh, we didn't see any of that at all. So Monday, uh, we still couldn't do any real work out there. Uh, no critical care facilities were available to our guys. Uh, but there was some small stuff that we can do, unfortunately, with uh, the transmission system being relayed out from Tavernier South. What the cause was very minor, uh, some debris and static or uh, ground wire in the line. So our guys were able to clear that out, and we were able to just, through our SCADA system, re-energize the entire transmission system that day all the way down to Marathon which heated up all of our substations. So at this point, uh, 24 hours after the storm, we're totally re-energized, the backbone of the system, and all substations are in. And when those substations came back up, about 50% at that point of our mainline distribution feeders were re-energized as well. They were only off because the substation was off or the transmission was off. And we also uh, have finalized the locations of our two base camps, which ended up being at uh, Founders Park here in Isla Mirada and at Marathon at our office facility there. We'd also uh, at 8 a.m. Uh, Monday morning requested all of the employees that had evacuated to return. Uh, fortunately for us on Tuesday uh, temporary trauma care was restored. I think those were military assets but we had access to them so we could care for our employees that were working out in the field at that time. Uh, the crews we had back at that point uh, began restoring critical loads and repairing the main distribution and about 75 percent of our main line feeders were restored by FKEC crews by the end of the day there and also significantly uh, the contract crews that we had requested started arriving. They had basically worked down the east coast of Florida Florida. A lot of them staged at the Daytona racetrack on the way down, waited for Irma to pass us. They ended up down at the Homestead Speedway until they could uh, get cleared through the uh, roadblock at the top of the stretch. So those guys started arriving then. I'm going to go back to 2009 again and show you another excerpt from uh, our final construction video showing this time the, the uh, kitchen, dining, uh, and food prep facilities that we built into uh, the operations center. This was an, it's kind of an expensive proposition at the time, and, and I, I think I sent an email to the board in the middle of all of this thanking them once again for allowing us to put this kind of facility in that operations center because it proved invaluable to us through Irma. We couldn't have fed our employees or a lot of these contract guys. Uh, when they were coming in. This is me talking about the facilities, and then I'll show you at the end how we use it. that operate out of this building at one time. Essentially, we probably have uh, 40, 45 chairs sitting in here now. We can't fit 95 chairs, which is uh, more than sufficient. Uh, this area is also designed as a, uh, essentially a cafeteria for storm uh, situations. Uh, we discussed that in, in prior videos. You see that we have our mobile serving line uh, set up here uh, with the drink holder at the, the end. It's our commercial kitchen. Again, this is a storm uh, feature that we 
building itself. We hope to be able to feed our crews for 72 hours and stand alone moment. We thought about the past. This is actually the kitchen facility itself, a large ice maker, three, uh, three cookers down here. Basically a uh, griddle for uh, four burner stove, a uh, deep fryer, both the griddle and a four burner stove. As in uh, prior videos about the commercial cooler and freezer uh, that is in place and operational. The front third is the cooler, front two thirds is the cooler itself, uh, and the back is the freezer itself. The things I mentioned in, in, in the past, what we intend to do is have a basically a three day uh, supply of food for all the employees put together uh, with a food supplier ready to go in the event uh, of a storm approaching us and it looks like we're going to get a direct or a significant indirect impact from it, we will have, uh, we'll purchase that three days worth of food and have it delivered down the store in here prior to uh, the strike or hurricane. So we won't basically stock it up every year. Uh, we'll just do that whenever we need to. Uh, hopefully we never have to because we really don't want to test everything out in here. So there you go again. It did just what we wanted it to do, and it. allowed us to get out there and get, get power back as fast as we possibly could. Uh, Wednesday, September 13th, uh, we finally uh, have our base camps established. Our crews continue uh, repairing uh, what they can repair. A lot of the rest of the contract crews made it in, so by the end of the day on September 13th, you can see we had over 350 contract employees here. Uh, working with our 114 employees in the restoration effort. And I say 114 employees, I mean every single employee of Florida Keys Electric Co-op. They were involved in the restoration effort. Uh, most office employees ended up working out in the field, but nobody did their traditional job duties during Irma. Everybody pitched into the, the effort. And you can see 40% uh, energized uh, system-wide by Wednesday, September 13th, and that's when we couldn't really start doing any, anything until Monday. Base camp life. Uh, the Upper Keys base camp I mentioned was at uh, Island, uh, the Founders Park, the other one in Marathon. They consisted of air-conditioned uh, cafeteria tents, uh, sleep trailers, shower facilities, uh, restroom facilities. And I, I would mention that you know when you're going through something like this, people are asking you a lot of questions about what you need and, and what they should bring and all that kind of stuff. And you know one thing you never really think of is how many porta potties do you need to feed or to uh, take care of this amount of people. I had no idea, but they suggested 25. And apparently for a camp of uh, 150 people, 25 is a good number. And that's what we went with. I'm going to show you a, uh, a drone video that we took of, of this. Uh, this is early in the morning. It just got daylight. And you can see a lot of the, the trucks are already gone. But this is the Alamorada Founders Park base camp. What you're seeing on the uh, left side of the screen there are the air-conditioned uh, sleep trailers. They're a lot like a submarine. About 30 to 35 people can be housed in there. They're individual bunks racked up two or three high. Each bunk has its own curtain. It has power in there, so uh, you know if a guy's in there, he can pull the curtain, have some privacy, plug his phone or iPad or whatever in, and, and watch movies or something if he's not so exhausted from working 16 hours. Uh, the trailer kind of by itself in the middle, that is the, uh, the shower facility. And uh, the big tent there uh, in the front part is the dining part of the, of the facility there and uh, the cooking area is in the back. And if you look closely on uh, the road there in the Founders Park, you see porta potties lined up five, five at a time. There are 25 of them sitting right there. Uh, Thursday, we really got after it. Um, and critical, I think, to this whole restoration effort was that second part where we took our traditional line crews and we broke them up completely. And we took every lineman we have and assigned to him two, three, maybe four contract crews and a tree crew. And we assigned each of those guys to a specific zone and asked them to repair power in that zone in the manner they thought most, co most effective to get the most people on in the shortest amount of time. These linemen you see around here know this system better than anybody. And by putting them in charge of an area that they know well and having them direct outside crews that are a little unfamiliar to our territory, I think paid off big time. And the funny thing is that decision there was made after Irma. Uh, John and I and, and Daryl Berkheimer were standing in a hallway 
and uh, talking about all these guys that we had ordered up and we're bringing in and John looked over at Daryl and said, well, Daryl, you've got till tomorrow morning to figure out how we're going to go about this. Daryl said, yes, sir, and we didn't see him until the morning, and he came back with this idea, and we thought it would work really well. And, and uh, so to Daryl, if you're out there, I'd like to thank you for that idea. He's right over there. But you know, I think that really allowed us to effectively utilize all of those 350 contract guys that we had in here. We continue working uh, from dusk till dawn, basically, and, and I, we put this in just to kind of show you the results of our restoration methodology. We talk about it a lot, that we work top down. Uh, if we work to start at transmission level, working down to distribution. And we also do what we can to restore power in a way that is the easiest to do, that will get the most people on. At, you know, basically the biggest bang for the buck. We don't want to spend five guys' time hanging one transformer for five hours to put two houses on when 30,000 people are out of power. And you can see the results of that right here. On Wednesday, the system was 40% energized. One day later, it had, gone, it had gone from 40 to 70%. There was a lot of little things we could do that would bring on a lot of people. Now you see that it took us from Thursday to Sunday to get that next 10%. We're starting to get down into the weeds now where we're having to do, in cases, a lot of work to get a few on. From Sunday to Tuesday, we got to 98% energized, which is traditionally considered basically out of storm mode at that point in time. And by Saturday morning, the 23rd, we had, we had energized those final 2%. Uh, so within those few amount of days, we had 100% of the members able to receive power back in service, but we still have probably a few hundred to this day uh, that still don't have electricity, their homes are too badly damaged to, to be able to power them up. They're gonna be in the process of uh, rebuilding and repairing those. Final tally, uh, Kale mentioned the cost of that at, at uh, roughly $20 million. These were all the outside assistance crews we brought in. I've talked about them quite a bit. But this is the amount of what work was done. Uh, and significantly, you can see 175 distribution poles had to be replaced. And I thought we'd be replacing hundreds, if not maybe thousands of distribution poles. I think that's a testament to the uh, pole inspection and replacement program we implemented back in 2006 with our, uh, our storm hardening efforts. We look at every single distribution pole in the system on a rotating a uh, seven-year basis and any of them that are found to be in need of replacement are, are replaced. We worked on 1,200 distribution poles in addition to the 175 we replaced. Significantly, we did not replace any transmission poles. And that was critical to us having that transmission and re-energized within 24 hours of Irma. We worked on 150 uh, transmission poles. Uh, most of that probably was distribution work, though a lot of our uh, mainline feeders are built underneath the transmission on those same transmission poles. And we had to replace 1,100 services. Uh, that's the slow work. It may take an hour or two or three to replace uh, a service that gets one house back on. My most favorite statistic out of all of this is this right here, no lost time accidents. Actually, we didn't have any kind of serious injury at all. I think we ended up with one minor shoulder strain, if I recall right, out of this. And that's just astounding if you consider the number of people that were working out in the field. They were working long hours every day. They were working a lot of days in a row. And it got pretty hot. And a lot of these guys were from Wisconsin and, and north states like that. It was very tough on them. For all of the people, our employees and the contract crews that were here to work in those conditions that amount of time and not hurt themselves is just astounding. It just shows they really did pay attention to safe work practices and, and working safely with each other. To wrap this up, I know I've gone pretty long today. Um, I want to do some thanks of my own like Doc did earlier. Uh, these guys, these are the contractors that, that we brought down. Uh, we extend sincere thanks to all of these guys. Uh, they traveled from Wisconsin, uh, Arkansas, Carolinas, Kentucky, Missouri, and Georgia to help us out. They worked along our guy, alongside our guys in the September heat to restore power to our community as if it were their own. They did exemplary work and brought skill and positive attitudes to each of the 10 days they worked side by side with us. And I hope they're here for us should we need them again.
I'd like to extend heartfelt thanks to these guys too, uh, the FKEC Board of Directors. You guys elected them uh, to represent your interest, and in my opinion, they've done that extremely well. They understood the need for a storm-hardened electric system, and they encouraged the staff of the co-op to find new and better ways to build a strong system. Their long-term commitment to that process and their willingness to allocate that extreme amount of funding uh, necessary to get the job done paid off in big time when Irma came to town. I'd like to thank you guys. Your patience, your words of encouragement and praise in the days after Irma help keep us focused on the task at hand and help keep us motivated to get the job done and get it done quickly. We uh, really appreciate all the thank you messages we receive both on social media and in the mail and, and in person. Your kind words, your friendly smiles, and uh, waves to all the people working in the, in the field made the 15 hour long days in the September heat more bearable and did give purpose to our work. Finally, uh, and most especially, I'd like to thank the employees of FKEC. They all rose uh, to the challenge before, during, and after Hurricane Irma made landfall. They put their needs of the cooperative ahead of their own needs and the needs of their own families. Every effort, or every employee, as I mentioned earlier, was involved in the restoration effort. And many of those people served in capacities that are far removed from their daily work duties. I can't thank them enough for all that they did, both for me and for you and the co-op. And I certainly can't bring them all up on the stage with me today, but if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, I'd really like to show you each and every one of their names.